All right, welcome back, family. We're doing another TikTok theology mastermind review, and this time we're looking at Bishop Jakes. Now, for the Black Church, Bishop Jakes is like the Godfather, you know, um, especially in the passing of uh, was it Charles Blake and uh, Reverend E. V. Hill, who were kind of like the old guard. Now, which interestingly enough, it was Carlton Pearson, who's one that I uh, pastor that I've mentioned before, um, who actually kind of brought Jakes to the forefront. Now, Jakes was already kind of doing his thing a little bit, but uh, it was Carlton that brought Jakes to the forefront at the Azusa uh, Street Revival, the, the Azusa Revival, which was the remake of the earlier revival that took place. I want to say in the 1900s. Don't quote me on that, though. Um, Ooh, and I used to I used to actually know all of the names of the people involved with that revival because it was it was very important to me for some reason back then. Uh, not so much now, but uh, Bishop Jake's ministry, uh, T.D. Jake's ministry is a ministry that I'm very familiar with. Um, at least two uh, of my mentors were like very close uh, to Bishop Jake's. Uh, and one of those was uh, Bishop Eddie Long and the other one was Apostle Ron Carpenter. And then um, the other two of uh, two others of my mentors were connected to Bishop Jakes, just not as closely. And that was Dr. R.A. Vernon and uh, Pastor Mike McClure, Jr. So but I, I've been following Jakes. Yeesh, uh, I think the the first five years I was saved, I read a lot of uh, a lot of Bishop Jakes books. Um, and I think by the time I was going through college, I stopped reading his books. Um, but just just from my perspective, I felt like there were a lot of fluff um, and, and that's not an attack on Bishop Jakes that that that's just a lot of the stuff that's in the self-help, you know, that's in the self-help genre. A lot of it is fluff um, and, and not necessarily intentionally. So there's sometimes people that, that there are things that people think are important that are not important. And and I don't know if anybody's ever written a book before, but it, it, it's really easy to uh, get very repetitive, you know. Um, you know, because a part of it, you feel like you got to fill up the book. Right. And so I did read a few, few, uh, um, Bishop's books in, in my later years. I think I read, I think I read one when I was an atheist instinct and that when I was like, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of through with this. Um, but, but yeah, I, I've never had any major issues with Bishop, uh, Bishop Jake's, um, of course, people do. Uh, obviously, he, he's the highlight of a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, but mind you, most of the things that he's being accused of right now as an atheist, I could just care less about. Those are things that that that, that don't really bother me. Um, and a lot of times, again, and y'all have heard me say this when we critique pastors, we don't all we don't always do an in-depth analysis of, of what they're actually doing and, and things of that nature. So uh, interesting thing about about Jake's is that he does employ a lot of people and, and his ministry does do a lot um, of outreach, uh, not not just here, but also overseas, uh, particularly in Africa. Uh, now, whether that outreach is actually helpful is a whole nother story. But but if it's not helpful, it's not because they don't want it to be helpful, at least from my perspective. Uh, from my perspective, it's not helpful because they're not critically engaging in what needs to happen. So if you believe that I'm helping you by telling you about Jesus, that then you will be kind of you will prioritize the message of Jesus over anything else that will actually be helpful. And you will convince yourself that I am doing something tangible by introducing these people to Jesus, you know, and that's the most important thing. And so sure, even if we spent millions of dollars on stuff that actually doesn't work, you know, at least it got us over here to tell them about Jesus. And, you know, and that's where that's, I'm not going to say all of the financial, uh, Irresponsibility in church comes from that type of thinking, but a great percentage of financial irresponsibility in church comes from that type of thinking. Even um, the, the elaborate um, salaries that some pastors get, it comes from the believers who, who, who have this idea. And I can speak explicitly for the black church, but you've now seen this crossover into urban churches, period. But there is this idea that my pastor needs to look like he's successful. He needs to look like God's hands are on them. 
And these and, and, and the hard part about superstitious ideas is that if your whole institution is rooted in superstition, then it really is hard to rationalize why you shouldn't do these superstitious ideas, you know. Um, so just kind of wanted to give that backdrop. Of course, before we jump in, please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, uh, consider joining our Patreon or our YouTube membership community. Check out the merch and consider volunteering. Um, the email address is dldd.us, and you can uh, fill out a volunteer form there. Uh, just a few days away from starting making our calls to the people who filled out the form. So you got about five more days. Get your form in. All right, so let's jump into this. Are y'all ready? Bishop Jakes, let's go. There is a time after you have suffered a while and cried a while and been empty a while and been plagued a while and been lonely a while and been frustrated a while and been without a while and had to be denied a while. Let, let, let's let's there's already enough. And, and the reason I love doing these is because it doesn't take long. Right. Uh, TikTok is perfect for this. And so. As I've pointed out in every video so far, and, and mind you, I am randomly picking these videos, right? I'm just typing in the preacher's name um, in TikTok and then picking whatever videos I can and putting them in a file and then randomly pulling them later on to, to do these videos. And so I'm not picking these in any, any type of order. And yet every single one of these that we've dealt with so far, and I want to say this is the fourth one, have dealt with this idea of trauma, of suffering. When you have suffered a while, when you have been through a while, when you have been down a while, ask yourself. And, and this is kind of where I do want to point out some of the performance, which is beautiful. Um, if, 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 if we were saying something here that, that was going to lead, lead to a better place, then this would be absolutely beautiful. And, 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 and even still, the performance of it is beautiful. It, it, it's what it's doing to people's mind that's troubling. And so you ask yourself when you're considering this, why is he hitting this point so hard? Why didn't he just say, well, when you've suffered a while and finished the sentence? Because the, the performance aspect of this is the more I say these words, like we used to call this a run in the black church. This is a run. Uh, literally in my notes, in my preaching notes, when I was the pastor of Kingdom Central, I'd have certain certain places in my notes where it says run this. You know what I'm saying? Or preach this or and because I was definitely an urban type style preacher, sometimes in my notes, it would literally say preach the hell out of this. Right. So but but th th these are runs. These are parts in the message where, you know, are going to really um, resonate with the audience. And, 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 and you probably wouldn't say it like this if you're still a preacher, but, you know, it's going to trigger a response. And in this case, an emotional response. Um, there is a movie. I can't remember what it was, but I do know Family Guy uh, picked at this scene uh, uh, as well. What was it? Is it? It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault, man. It wasn't your fault, man. It wasn't your fault. And then the more you say that to the person, eventually the person begins to break down and cry. Well, ultimately, this is that same type of practice being used here. It's I am reforcing this idea when you have suffered a while, when you've gone through a while, when you have put up with a bunch of stuff, when you've made it through stuff that nobody else would have made it through, when you've taken off your hat and taken off your, you know, you just keep running it and you keep running it. And the longer you run it, and of course, you don't want to get just foolish with it. But the longer you run it, it get, it's almost like creating a wave at a, at a sports arena, you know, or, or just a, a, a slow build. You remember slow clap. One person starts slow clapping. Somebody else starts slow clapping. And then everybody else starts slow clapping, cl clapping because much of the church experience and it isn't just a church experience. This is our concert experience. This is our political experience. This is you know, this is our entertainment experience, period, is monkey see, monkey do. And so I say it the first time when you've suffered a while and maybe that hit about five percent of my audience when you've gone through enough. And then maybe another two percent of my audience catches in. And when you're tired and, and then maybe another 10 percent of my audience comes in. And by this moment, I have enough of, of a majority to have velocity in this moment. Now, most pastors, pastors are not thinking it through with this type of precision. But that's exactly that's uh, uh, exactly what's going on is you're building up velocity in the moment by I don't want to use the word manipulating because this isn't necessarily 
necessarily malicious. Again, a lot of this is learned behavior. This is I've learned how to get these people to respond to me. I've learned how to give these people what they expect, what they want to get from this service. And that's what many of them want. They want that emotional vulnerability where they feel like they're able to kind of get free of some stuff. Right. But so that that's why he's hitting it over and over and over again. In many ways, it's not very different you know, then a mantra, you know, or, or a chant. Um, it's just we've learned, which is why sometimes I do laugh at some of my, 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 my meditating contemporaries who insist that meditation is only done a specific way. I mean, to say that is to completely ignore the neuroplasticity of the mind and the individual and the individuality of the individual, you know. And so so things are, are very different. And, and, and in many ways, the, the performance of church has has tapped into these things in ways that the doctrine of church has not allowed them to explore. You know, but church is not alone in that, you know, even entertainers who do the same types of things. A stand up comedians are amazing at this. Sometimes I'd encourage you to, to, to watch a few of the younger urban pastors like Michael Todd or somebody and then watch a black stand up comedian and you will begin to see. Oh, I see some of this stuff. And so some of this stuff is cultural. And, and, and then, you know, to take it a step further, you know, watch the hip hop awards when, when people are giving their speeches. Right. And then you will begin to notice a lot of those saying you know, I was going to write an article um, a few months ago about this preacher's growl that that is very common in, in, in the black churches. Now, it's not restricted to the black churches, but it is very common to the black churches. This kind of this hum, this growl. And, 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 I, and what I wanted to do was is to help people understand that this growl doesn't exist in a vacuum. It comes out of a cultural practice of animism that had to be kind of reshaped um, through Christianity through because of slavery and colonialism, you know. And so there are people who had to integrate uh, or assimilate African practices into their Christian practices as a way of somehow preserving their heritage. Um, but in this case, with a lot of our churches, a lot of these preachers who are doing this do not have uh, that type of connection with the information to even understand that's how they get it. So it's very much hand-me-down theology. And most of the most of the people who've received that hand-me-down theology has not, you know, done any due, due diligence here. Uh, but I also did want to point out here, again, this is definitely trauma, right? It's you're, you're preaching to people who are tired of living. You're preaching to people who are having a hard time living. And, and I remember what it felt like to be in, in this type of circle where every Sunday this type of preaching resonated with you. And I, I remember telling um, somebody who was my worship pastor at that time, this was about 2013. And I was like, hey, I'm kind of tired of this. Like I'm, I'm, I'm tired of feeling like I can't move forward in life and I can't figure life out. And then I realized like that was the cycle we were in, the cycle that many people are in 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 these ur urban circles. And they may not be able to articulate it this way, but it is a cycle where you are not good enough. You do not have enough. And if it isn't if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't even be alive. If it wasn't for God, you would not even make it through stuff. And, and it sounds so bad be or sounds so good because we all want to feel like we are going through the most impossible storm in the world. We all want to feel justified in being afraid of what we're dealing with. We want to feel justified and, and not dealing with life many times. And this type of preaching kind of does that. Like, no, life is hard. It's really, really hard. That's, and that's why you need a God. And unfortunately, that, that puts people in a place where they start having really unrealistic expectations and therefore unrealistic approaches to life. One of my theories or one of my hypotheses, rather, hypotheses, is that the more we begin to separate our species from superstition, we're going to see an accelerated increase of problem solving.
You know, I think one of the reasons why we still have so many problems, which I don't know if there'll ever be a time when we don't have problems. So please don't take this to mean that's what I'm saying. But I think one of the reasons why we do still have so many problems that perhaps we shouldn't have anymore is because one of the things we don't really realize is that we don't have a lot of people at the table trying to solve the problems. When you look at the amount of people complaining about problems and the amount of people who are, who are actually trying to solve the problems, there is a huge disconnect. And a part of that disconnect is because a, a major group of our species feels like it is not our obligation or responsibility to solve the problems, you know, and, and a part of that comes comes from preaching like this. All right, let, 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 let's continue. There is a place that comes along after you've been confused a while, after you've been in anguish a while, after you've been tormented a while. There is a win, win, win. There is a time, my brothers and sisters, that God just says enough. All right. I make sure I stop it because it will keep on playing if I know. All right. So, so, all right. Uh, one of the funny parts there, uh, I knew it was going to do that. One of the funny parts there is that he goes into this win, 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 win. And I don't know if you uh, noticed this, but he forgot what he was saying. He, he forgot where he was going. And, and, I, and I'm not giving that as a not all people do that, you know. So that's not all. Oh, look at the snake preacher forgot what he was saying. This is proof that he's a snake. No, 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 no. I just wanted to call it out, you know, because that's what I do as preachers. Uh, but but he says you get to a point where God has said it's enough. That part is definitely problematic. And, and mind you, I, I, I think I did this with, 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 the, with the other ones before as well. Mind you, now, this, is, this, this clip was likely not up, uploaded by Bishop Jakes himself. This was likely uploaded by somebody else who just saw this clip and it encouraged them. And that's why we're doing it this way, because most of these clips are, are, are shared by people, not these ministries, but people who looked at this and says, yes, this is good for me. Yes. This is what I want, which ultimately a part of the problem with our superstitions, superstitions is that it does rob us of the ability of actually knowing what is good for us. Because there are many people who will listen to this and say, this is exactly what I needed. When in all reality, nothing that was said in this was anything that you needed. Nothing that was said in this was actually helpful. Literally, I can condense th this whole segment down to, 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 to almost one sentence. When you have suffered enough, God will say enough. That, that was the whole thing. When you have suffered enough, God will say enough. What the fuck does that even mean? Like, how is that information actually helpful? This is something that I struggled with, especially my last 10 years in the ministry, is realizing that a lot of the stuff we're saying sounds nice as an anecdote, but in all actuality, it really isn't anything. We didn't say anything substantive. We didn't say anything substantial. We didn't say anything significant. We didn't say anything that could actually help somebody. We just lullabied you, rock a -bye, baby, right back into believing that everything is going to be okay and you don't have to do anything to make it okay. Just that good things happening in your life are totally outside of your hands. It's totally in the will of God, you know, totally in the hands of God. And, and, and honestly, I believed that for quite a long time in my life that good things are happening because I please God, you know? And so, you know, uh, this just reminds me of this adage. Of the, there's a song we used to sing, uh, and some churches still sing it, um, by Dottie Peoples. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. Well, if you didn't come when I want you, you're not on time. Let's just make that clear. And 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 that it's it's that same type of that I see here is that when you've had enough, God will say enough. But what does that mean? When God says enough, what is what does that mean? And why has it taken so long for God to say enough? Why did God have to wait? for one individual person to have suffered enough to say, okay, enough is enough. Why, why, why didn't, why wasn't the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, why, why didn't God step in then and say, okay, enough is enough. Why, why didn't the, the God, uh, why didn't God step in during the uh, African Holocaust, the Ma'afa, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the, the, the East, Eastern um, 
uh, slave trade through the uh, through the Muslims. Um, why, why didn't God say enough is enough? Then the the, the, the medieval uh, church that was destroyed with, with with hundreds of parishioners on the inside of it praying. Why didn't God say enough is enough? Then you know what I'm saying. So so this is now tying your tying your expectations into something that has never happened. And that I do find dangerous. You know, your your expectations is tied. Eventually, baby, God is going to say enough is enough. That's like saying eventually, baby, Jesus is going to crack the sky. The people who fall, you know, who believe this type of stuff, because I don't want to just say fall for it, because one of the things and I, and, and I know this, it may rub some of you the wrong, wrong, wrong way sometimes. But I'm telling you, my goal is to humanize this stuff It's for you to understand that, you know, Believe it or not, there aren't as many villains out here as we think. They're just a bunch of misguided people. And because some of the people, you know, who we think are just the worst villains, these are people, they, they believe the same superstitions that their parishioners believe. They just have a greater sense of cognitive, cognitive distance from it because they have to live a way in order to be successful where they couldn't possibly depend on the stuff that they preach. But in a very patronizing way, which they don't see as patronizing, they believe that these people who come to church don't know any better. And so they can't tell them straight out that, hey, you need to handle your stuff. You know, so so these are some of the some of the things that we see here. So uh, this was an interesting one. I, you know, hopefully as we move forward, we'll get some better ones with Bishop Jakes because Jakes is a preaching machine. Um, and I say that, and and I and I'll I also say, even when I was a pastor, I didn't like listening to Jake's sermons, not the whole sermons. I'd much rather just listen to his clips. There were certain people I could listen to their whole sermons. Now I can't listen to anybody's sermons, and my wife will testify to this because for the past ten years I've tried. I've literally tried, um, primarily because I was looking looking for some things, just kind of looking and seeing. If 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 urban theology was taking a pivot towards, you know, free thought anytime soon, um, it's taken a pivot towards people centric somewhat, but it hasn't taken a pivot towards progressive thinking yet. You know, so so a lot of these churches, urban churches, they, they are absolutely like uh, life affirming in the sense of, you know, if you're gay or whatnot, they don't care. You know what I'm saying? The problem is they're not going to preach it that way. You know, and they're not always going to practice it that way. Some of them will. Now, there are a lot of there are a lot of urban churches out there who have um, openly gay people on their praise team, openly gay people, a part of their their ministry. But it's just not a conversation, you know, and I, I agree that that is a step in the right direction, but it's too small of a step, you know, and and too short eyed of a direction. So so I think we, we can do that. Uh, but I hope you guys have been able to get something from this. I think that's all I have for now. I do like to try to keep these videos uh, a little shorter, which I say shorter, but this has still been 30 minutes, right? Um, well, it's under 30 minutes, so so that counts. But um, again, remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, consider joining our Patreon or our YouTube community program. Uh, also, check out our merch and consider volunteering, dldd.us. All right. Thank you so much. Until next time, keep rising, stay progressive and stay beautiful.